so we'll wait for uh, Rebecca to join, but let's, um, let's go ahead and formally get started. Uh, welcome, my name is Peter Nestor. I work as a manager at DSR, Business for Social Responsibility, uh, based here in San Francisco. Um, I think I might be the only person at the conference using actual paper notes. Um, it's a little bit of a Luddite in that respect, but uh, feel free to take out your laptops and, and type away as well. Um, so welcome to this fireside chat. That is the uh, format for today's talk. Um, it is called Human Rights Obligations of Home States and Parent Companies. Um, although I think you'll find that the conversation will probably be a lot more uh, involved than that. Um, and quite frankly, we're happy to take it really in whatever direction the group would like to go. This is intended to be a very informal format, and so hoping to get some uh, good questions and discussion from those in the room. Uh, please feel free to jump in, uh, interrupt with any thoughts or questions as the conversation gets flowing, um, and just imagine that there is a real fire right here and we're all sort of sitting around it, uh, having Oh, there's a fire. Oh, there's a fire section. Good. Um, Great, so I think the goal today really will be to um, look at how companies who have committed to respecting human rights um, operate in countries that are challenging environments from a human rights perspective, and specifically around what the engagement looks like there. So engagement with the host country and engagement back with the home country as well. Um, and I think just for our panelists, and we'll, we'll, we'll let uh, Rebecca know this as well when she arrives, but I, the, focus, I think, of today's talk is really to try to keep it on practical, um, a, a practical discussion. Not like it's... Hi, Rebecca. Hi. Sorry. Hi. 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 Are you, uh, yeah. Sorry. Uh, I just finished another session. Oh, no, that's fine. So, okay. Okay. Uh, yes, yeah, so what are you, what are you saying? Run away. <laughs> My schedule got messed up, and somehow I thought it was at a later time. Oh, okay. Well, it's pretty informal, so uh, hopefully we uh, can just jump right in. Um, we're just just getting underway, um, so uh, welcome. Uh, so just saying that I think the I hope the focus for today's talk can be very uh, practical focused in terms of what is what companies are actually doing, what countries are actually doing, uh, or or could be doing. Um, and so we have about an hour. Uh, together, and uh, and looking to looking to jump. Um, uh, before we get started, I wanted to just see sort of who is in the room um, joining us today. So just by a show of hands only, um, who is here from representing companies or businesses, if any? A couple, um, and civil society or NGO community. Okay. Any academics in the room? A couple, and then any representatives from governments? All right. Well, we'll be sure and let them know what we think as we talk about exactly what they should be doing. Oh, yeah, right on, right on time. Yes, we want the stakeholder. Let's let's move to yeah. We just move. Sure. Um, and good, and let me go ahead and introduce who's up on stage, although I don't think it'll take much of an introduction. Um, probably just their first names are enough. I guess starting in the middle, Michael uh, Posner is a professor of business and society at NYU's Stern School of Business, uh, where he is currently launching the first center on business and human rights at a business school. Uh, prior to joining NYU, Mike served in the Obama administration as Assistant Secretary of State for the Bureau of Democracy, Human Rights, and Labor at the State Department. Uh, and from 1978 to 2009, he led Human Rights First, New York-based human rights advocacy organization. Uh, Rebecca McKinnon, uh, who is a genuinely, genuinely confused person. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. Sorry. Uh, yeah. Sorry. So is, is <laughs> genuinely confused, I suppose, but also uh, a senior research fellow at the New America Foundation, works with the University of Pennsylvania and Internews on the Ranking Digital Rights Project, uh, and the author of Consent of the Network, The Worldwide Struggle for Internet Freedom, published in 2012. Um, Rebecca also spent a considerable amount of time in Asia, uh, working as the CNN Bureau Chief in Beijing and Tokyo from 98 to 2003. 
Patrick Caselius is joining us uh, as the Senior Advisor on Digital Rights at Telia Sonera. Uh, Telia Sonera is a Swedish-based telecoms company uh, with operations throughout Europe, Central Asia, South Asia, and Spain. Um, Patrick has been working on freedom of expression and privacy issues for over 20 years and has been instrumental in helping to establish multi-stakeholder initiatives, uh, including the Global Network Initiative and the <coughs> Industry Dialogue. Um, so very happy to have all of our panelists here. Um, so let's jump right in. Uh, obviously under the UN guiding principles on business and human rights, uh, businesses have an obligation to respect human rights, states have an obligation to protect human rights, to support businesses in doing so. Uh, that can become very gray when companies are operating in higher risk environments. So I uh, wondered if I could just sort of turn to the group and kind of level set a little bit for everyone in the room, maybe frame some of the issues. Um, what are the types of challenges that we're seeing, say have we seen, and can we expect to see over the next couple of years uh, in these types of environments where businesses are operating in high risk kind of environments uh, from a human rights perspective? So from the technology companies. Yeah, should I start off? Sure. Um, and as said, Telesona, we have our home operations in, in the Nordic and Baltics, but we also have operations in countries in Eurasia. And uh, I see uh, three main uh, challenges uh, when uh, operating there. Uh, one is about the laws. And uh, as when we here at RightsCon and, and people that we meet daily uh, can uh, you know, know the difference between contribute, uh, court contribute and link in the public debate, uh, that's all often uh, mixed up. So when we uh, operate <coughs> under very restrictive uh, and, and draconian laws, uh, uh, we, we are accused of uh, causing human rights uh, violations rather <coughs> being able to. Uh, so that's something which is a challenge for us in, 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 in addressing these issues uh, when we are to respect human rights also in these operations. Uh, Another challenge with these laws are that uh, they most often contain provisions on confidentiality. So that when we want to be uh, transparent on major events, that is uh, networks closed down, uh, etc., uh, the laws uh, prohibit us to do so. That's a big challenge and, and uh, it's sometimes uh, often very frustrating. So that's the, the laws. Uh, another big challenge is, is uh, what I would call uh, heritage, where uh, we uh, as a company have not built the operations in these countries from the start, but we have rather acquired existing uh, operations uh, uh, with their licenses, with their uh, models of uh, etc. So, so um, uh, a challenge is that uh, uh, most often we don't have a 100% ownership of these com companies. We might have 80% or 60% or in some kind of cases 49% or 20%. Uh, and there is a, a governance issue how to implement uh, our, our values uh, which are formulated in our uh, group policies in, into these uh, uh, and I can talk maybe a little bit more about uh, that. Sure, sure. Uh, and and, and uh, 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 a third challenge I want to mention is that uh, whereas the point of challenge and the discussion is ongoing on an international level and, and uh, we, we, we build the understanding and, 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 and define ways forward, uh, that is not very much happening yet the local uh, ground. As I, I said that in the panel I was in yesterday. Uh, we need to find next steps to, to have uh, the dialogue and the point of challenge happening also uh, on the ground in these countries. Mm -hmm. So those were three challenges I see. Okay. And even maybe just to be a little bit more specific about what's happening. So, so a lot of this is coming from, say, uh, requests from governments uh, for information, for data about users. Um, or coming in the form of surveillance activities or in the form of network shutdown type activities. 
Um, yeah, so in many of these countries you have both uh, what we know as you know, day-to-day -day normal lawful intercept um, to, to, to prosecute uh, drug dealings or whatever crimes there are. And there are requests from prosecutors, uh, as we know it, in, in, in our own countries. And besides that, uh, in parallel, uh, in many countries there is a system which is called SORM, uh, which is a system for unrestricted direct access, where government has uh, access to uh, our systems and our networks in a way that we are completely uh, uh, without control of. And, uh, and this, of course, is a huge problem from a uh, human rights. Anything to, uh, anything to add in terms of um, what we might be seeing uh, in, the, in the future on some of these uh, issues? Or is that, is that, does that kind of capture where the challenges really lie? I mean, there are, there are multiple challenges, but you know, one other that um, <clears throat> we worked a lot on when I was in the State Department with John and others uh, really had to do with the risks to users in tough environments, and I think especially with mobile phones. Uh, there just is a huge, people don't know the risks they're under, they don't understand the extent to which governments, the U.S. government, but certainly lots of pernicious governments, um, are afraid of uh, advocacy, they're afraid insecure governments behave badly um, when they're confronted by people who are organizing and challenging. And I think we, we looked at seven or 80 countries in the last five or six years that have passed new laws, regulations, both yeah, limiting freedom of association, free speech, free press, going after bloggers, but there's also the more pernicious side, which is really, you know, getting inside people's computers, getting inside their phones. Nothing is secure, and I think a lot of the activists don't know or appreciate how, um, how vulnerable they are, and so they take risks. And so I think that's a big subject, and both for the advocacy community, for the philanthropic community, for governments, to really try to understand that and, and get behind it is very hard. Just to, again, kind of broaden the bigger picture here, kind of the issue of responsibilities and, and, and kind of what companies can do. I mean, the, the issue is that there's no country on earth where governments aren't making things that arguably <coughs> violate user rights in some way. And when you're talking about sort of the, the home, you know, the, the company that's going out and doing business elsewhere in, in regimes, in, in markets where the regimes are considered particularly repressive, you know, what do you do? And I was, I along with Mike and, and Patrick was, was there too, we, we were involved with setting up the Global Network Initiative that in, in many ways is, is meant to give companies guidance on dealing with these issues and the you know the fundamental problem is that law is law ranges from bad to complete crap right kind of around the world right it's it's, it's on that kind of scale going down and and you know there's 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 not a lot of places where the law is really great um, and and in most places even in democracies law is getting worse in a lot of cases around speech online around intermediary liability around uh, a, 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 you know, so Turkey is a really great example, um, and and so what is a company to do? Because if a company is going to say I'm not going to do business anywhere where the law is bad, they will do law. They will do business absolutely zero nowhere, right? So so it's a it's a bad world out there with a lot of bad law, and so what are what are the principles? To, to think about. Now, in an ideal world, we would have had our principles, we would have had G&I, we, we would, would have had, you know, rugby principles around long before telecommunications and internet companies started spreading out in the world. Um, so that we would have started from a point of due diligence before anybody started doing business. But that didn't happen, right? And so with, with G&I, and let's you know take the case of Yahoo, which was one of the seminal cases of doing business in a difficult environment where a company got in trouble. Right, Yahoo got in trouble because they went into China, set up an email service, and didn't think through the consequences. They didn't do their due diligence about what it was going to mean to have an email service in a regime where 
you are, if you're running an email service, you're going to be handing over dissident information to the government. That's just a given. And they hadn't thought through what those implications were going to be and how they were going to handle it or anything. And, and then the Shi Tao case happened where the, the Chinese journalist Shi Tao uh, got jailed and, and on, on evidence provided by Yahoo and there was information leaked that proved this. And, you know, and that was one of the cases that led to the formation of GNI. But, the, the principles that the GNI developed and the operational guidelines were that you know, thou shalt commit civil disobedience in every market that you're doing business in. That's not the principle, right? The principle is you will do your due diligence before you go in and make decisions about what you are and are not going to offer based on the context, um, the, the legal situation, and do everything you can if you decide to go in to mitigate risks. And you know, in an ideal world, you've kind of done this before you've gone in, right? Um, and then you're also going to be transparent about what it is that you're having to comply with, and making sure your users are well informed. So if you're operating in a place that you know has a direct line, you know, has a black box on your on on your, you know, on on, on in in your um, facilities in that country that users have an opportunity to, to kind of be aware of the type of surveillance that you are operating under so that they can then make informed choices about, uh, about how to use the service. So it's kind of an issue of transparency. But it's hard because you really wish that these <coughs> principles had been set up before we got so far because now everybody's having to backtrack. Now everybody's having to say, well, we're already in all these places, and in some cases, some due diligence was done, but in a lot of cases, not, not so much. And co governments have already gotten very accustomed to making all kinds of demands and having full compliance uh, from multinational companies as, as well as from domestic ones. And now, how do we sort of walk it back to, to and, and that's, that's a real challenge. It's, it's really difficult, and I certainly feel for, for Patrick for being in, in that position. One, one, day, um, one thing where we should do more, of, uh, and I agree, is, is, is to be transparent about what these laws really mean. Uh, at the same time, I think many, many users uh, do know that, they, that, that there is uh, far more surveillance. Uh, and, and, the word, and, and, and what happens is uh, sometimes they don't use their phones, which is bad for our business. So this is why sustainability and respect of human rights is, is a business case for us. Uh, one way of addressing uh, you know, the onboard situation, because there is, of course, new requests and, and, uh, and, and changes of the operation of, of, of the surveillance, etc., is that we implement a, a, a very strict escalation procedure within the company. So as where uh, a couple of years ago, uh, if there was a, a much too far going um, uh, demand from, from the regime, the decision would be taken uh, locally. Uh, today we have a very strong uh, policy on, on, on group level with a very strong statement from the CEO. So when there is a too far going um, uh, demand locally, the local people can point at this is what another company was once, this is the statement from the CEO, and I am told to escalate. And the escalation procedure uh, draws away uh, the decision from the local context where the local person might be uh, for various reasons, uh, uh, have difficulties to to pursue the point of challenge, which is easier uh, further up in the session, and less difficult. Can, can I just stop with one thing? Real quick? Yeah. This is really uh, following on what Rebecca talked about. You mentioned the guiding principles and you know what are the various responsibilities. I think we're at a point now in this industry and frankly many other industries where we have to go beyond every company on a journey um, and corporate social responsibility. We've got to talk about what Rebecca talked about, basically standards for each industry, real standards, concrete standards. What are the, what's, what's the core business? How does a company make a profit? 
And in that area, what are the human rights challenges? And what are the in, what's the industry across the board going to do? Industry has to be involved in that discussion, setting the standards. They're not going to be imposed from outside. But then, what are the metrics? What are the ways to implement? What are the ways to evaluate? And how do you basically then create some notion of consumer investor pressure? One company looking at another, and the industry and the people outside looking at it and saying, who's doing a better job? That's, I think, the, the theory of the GNI. It's the theory of some other multi-stakeholder initiatives. There are different ways to go about it. There isn't one size fits all. But I think too many companies have been in the position of saying, well, we're doing our best. We have a nice process. We have a statement from somebody inside that says we really care. No. We have to start looking at real standards and metrics. And that's also what Rebecca's been doing in this space, trying to really begin to figure out how you evaluate companies. Again, companies need to be part of the discussion, but it can't just be due diligence. I, at the end of the day, Professor Ruggie said, we're at the end of the beginning of the discussion. Let's get on to the middle of the discussion and create some real standards. Yeah, and an interesting point in terms of the evaluation, because that would ideally happen publicly. It would ideally be very transparent. Um, and yet, one of the tensions, particularly in this aspect of, of companies doing business in these countries, is that it seems, over the past few years, there have been more examples of effective engagement that often occurs behind the scenes. Um, or that there is a transparency tension there, right, between how much companies can disclose publicly about what they're doing, um, potentially restricted by the government or potentially for other reasons, and yet a demand from civil society or other stakeholders or other public groups that would like to see some insight into what's what's going on here. What's the what's the scope of responsibility look like? Yeah, well, you know, there's some parallels in that debate between parallels about WikiLeaks. You know, like can can you put? I mean, I'm I'm sort of drawing a high, you know, kind of extreme parallel, but you know, the argument that everything has to be out there in public, or you know, in order to achieve human rights, do there actually need to be some confidential processes and secrets going on and and if you get, you know, what's the right level of transparency to be accountable, whereas, you know, is, is radical transparency really going to achieve, achieve human rights or is it going to achieve something else? And, and I think this is, this is one of the, you know, bringing it back, you know, from my radical analogy to, to reality here, I, I think this is one of the dilemmas we face, you know, with my rankings project, I think with GNI, with a lot of human rights related um, uh, processes, in, at least in the ICT sector on free expression and privacy, and I imagine on other issues too, where there are some things that if you shed light on them, you will kill them. Um, there, there, there are some things that companies are doing that, that actually, if you expose too much information about what they're doing to protect their most vulnerable users, then, then that's going to actually result in governments finding ways to destroy that effort. Um, and, and so, you know, I've, I've found, or, or, or also just in terms of how companies engage with stakeholders, there's a lot of stakeholder engagement, if it were made too public, couldn't happen. Um, and, and so achieving the right balance in terms of being transparent where transparency really promotes accountability. Um, or, or also, like I've been having a lot of discussions with companies about how much detail they can, they can disclose about their human rights impact assessments, which, you know, or, or their human rights due diligence and risk assessment processes internally. And, you know, there's a fine balance there because they're really kind of asking themselves the hard questions. And if they put that out all out there in public, is that actually, you know, so you want to have some, you want to have some level of, you know, informing the public about what you're doing. But at, at the other, on the other hand, you know, in order to actually do an operation, in, in order to have an honest internal conversation, you can't have that entire conversation in public, um, or it won't happen. And and so so just as with kind of with government, you know, if you're going to do, you know, not everything can be on a wiki. Uh, you know, yeah. similarly, uh, companies in their efforts to achieve respect at, uh, for user rights have to achieve the right balance. And I think this is where you know, we as civil society and, and other stakeholders can really help companies you know, try and work constructively on where you get that balance right. 
yeah. and, and yeah. to kind of push to the extent possible, but also recognize that radical transparency is probably not the answer, or in, in my opinion, it's, it's yeah. not. Yeah, and I'd, I'd love to hear from some of the more the civil society focused um, people. In the, yeah, sure, go ahead. Um, yeah, this is from the civil society, not from business, but I'm, I'm kind of sympathizing a little bit with how difficult the problem is for businesses and I see some parallels with the arms control um, sort of debates and everything. And in that if you're a, a civic minded or socially responsible company, you know that if you don't say, for example, sell to Iran, <coughs> then your competitor is going to. And it seems like these standards, um, codes of conduct, uh, whatever, unless they're universal, or at the very least, laws of, a, of one domestic, one country, then it's going to be very hard, if not impossible, for a company that is, after all, you know, seeking profit to just restrain themselves voluntarily from a market. Yeah. I mean, how it's, does that work exactly? It's and I'm hard, asking great, not impossible. And if you could just give yeah. your name and organization. Miriam Namar Sadeghi, we work on, uh, on Iran, e-learning for human rights for Iran. How exactly do we expect these companies to restrain themselves if there's no law, at, or at the very, you mean? Well, we're the, talking, go ahead. Just on Iran in particular, uh, you know, one of the things, part of this discussion is also home country regulation, and um, there was a, uh, a, a regulation, an executive order out of the Obama administration relating to uh, transfer of technology to Iran and Syria. Now we can debate how well it was enforced. That's a discussion unto itself. Um, but I think there are a number of ways now, especially on the reporting side, where government is beginning, uh, the U.S. government at least, is beginning, for example, on Burma and lifting the JDAG. They're now uh, reporting requirements for every company doing $500,000 worth of business who they're dealing with, what the human rights implications are, Dodd-Frank on extractive industries in Congo. But I think there's probably some ways in which, in some ways, governments, home governments, can at least uh, create some greater you know, public awareness of what's going on, what I call the dark side of the world. Because like after 2009, just really quickly, after 2009 Green Movement, you know, we all said, oh, it's so terrible, Nokia Siemens sold this mobile surveillance technology to the Iranian regime. To this day, at least I don't know how we would have done that differently. What, can, what exactly could, could anyone have done to prevent something like that? Well, well that's what these regulations were meant to do. Yeah. Two things. I mean, um, <laughs> with due respect, but the, the, the question is some kind of, somehow, uh, wrongly put. Okay. So what I need to do within my company and my colleagues within other telecoms is to explain the business case to respect human rights. If there is no business case, if, if, if I don't make it uh, visible that this is what investors want, this is what customers want, this is what our employees want, this is what the international community wants, then it won't happen in my company. Mm -hmm. So it's a business case for, for our business to respect uh, and the other way of doing it is, of course, going together because you have much less leverage. If Nokia NSN is part of our industry dialogue, nine companies today, it would have been easier for them in, a, in, a, in the context of shared learning within the industry dialogue and also in the work with, uh, between the industry dialogue and GNI mm -hmm. to know what to do at the time of, of, of uh, when the equipment was sold. Uh, it was or it was not? The industry dialogue and the GNI, the industry dialogue at least didn't exist at the time. I don't know if the GNI. Didn't. So, so one way of addressing the difficulty is to join forces to have better leverage. But I, I mean, but I, I push back. You know, yeah. uh, there are going to be companies that are not are going to say we have a business case to make to our board. Yeah. that is about selling to Syria and Iran, and they can, can make money. That's and by the way, Nokia Siemens just made the, the socially responsible decision. They're not going to do it, so the market just opened up to us. Exactly. So that's, that's, why, that's why it's so important that additional players join mm -hmm. GNI and yeah. or uh, industry data. Do you yeah, have any absolutely. NGOs here, any civil society from South Africa? Is one of the companies that I would pay attention to is MTN yeah. on this point. 
Positive in or what, negative? In what sense? Well, if they, you know, this is publicly reported, they are involved. And there's very little attention in South Africa to their involvement. And maybe coming back just to this, the, the initial discussion on, on the, just finding the balance between being transparent and being effective in some cases. Do we have any, are we starting to see companies that are setting good examples uh, that other companies can follow? Or, or, or Patrick, when you're trying to work through some of these decisions internally, um, are you looking to other, are you looking to guidance from other companies that have gotten it right? As to transparency? Uh, yeah, as to how do you be, how, uh, on the <coughs> transparency yeah. issue. Yeah. So the issue of transparency is what, what we have is there is a, quite a pressure in the U.S. and some, somewhat also in the U.K. On, on the telecoms to be transparent. There is much less uh, pressure elsewhere in the world. Uh, uh, for example, my company, we published a, a, a figure, a, a total figure, in, in, what, uh, how many requests that we received in Finland. And it, it, uh, it, had, it hasn't been noticed whatsoever, so we have had no questions and no debates. So the debate is very vivid here and somewhat in, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the UK, but not elsewhere. Mm -hmm. um, I'm, as to transparency, I come back to um, my customers, our cust my company's customers in, 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 in Eurasia and elsewhere. Uh, and I see that it's it's more so the major, what we call the major events, and uh, and, uh, and specifically so uh, unrestricted real-time access, which is the main problem for the main violation of, of freedom of expression. So that's where we should shed more light and, and work more, because there no one has control how much the government uh, access, and. Uh, um, and of course, there is also networks, shutdowns, etc. One thing I want to highlight is that in, in uh, our customers in these countries are predominantly uh, 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 prepaid voice and SMS. It's not internet. Okay, data will come in due time, but today uh, it's more uh, uh, voice and SMS, etc. And in the debates like uh, these days here at RightsCon. Uh, I sometimes feel that the discussions are too focused on, on, on the internet, whereas when my customers' uh, SMS networks shut down, <coughs> that is as much a violation of human rights. And we need to acknowledge that and take that into account in our discussions mm -hmm. as well. And when we want to try to be transparent on these major events, and I'm coming to my point, there are these provisions on confidentiality we're not allowed to tell. Uh, sometimes we were uh, in, in one occasion many years ago. We were even told to 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 tell a lie why why the uh, uh, network was down. That of course we refused. But we have not been able to. You know, we don't break the law and, and tell. What we have done is that we have published on our homepage uh, a short note saying that during the last nine months in this region, Eurasia, there were approximately 20 <coughs> requests for network shutdown. Blockings. But if we go further than that, we will break uh, the law. We would want to go further, but we, we can. Yeah. Michael, Rebecca, any sort of other examples or companies <coughs> that you're thinking of that have, that have started to get this balance right or where sort of the stakeholder community has been um, understanding of the, of the company position? Well, we both work with the you know, Yahoo, Google, Microsoft, you know, six, seven years ago in setting up the GNI, and they took a risk. They came into a room with with NGOs, with you know, uh, social investment funds and the like, and they said, let's negotiate standards, and and then they put themselves through the paces. And they've now, Sarah Altshuler talked about it yesterday, but they've now begun to evaluate Rebecca's building on it by doing these um, these metrics. I think again, the telcos haven't stepped up. Where where's Twitter? Where are there a whole bunch of other companies that aren't at the table? So I think it's to the credit of those that were the first there and, and you know, put themselves at risk by being out there. Um, I think it can be done, it's not only the telcos, it's also where Cisco. You know, there's a slew of companies that are involved in this space that ought to be essentially, you know, judged by similar criteria. Again, they should help define the territory. But then let's have a real discussion. Metrics, let's have a real 
you know, you do it in the financial uh, world. No company thinks twice about financial reporting. Everybody holds the same standard. The public expects it. If you want to talk about the business case, the business case comes when consumers can evaluate one com company against another by the same standard. That's what we need to get to. Yeah, I mean, it's very much a work in progress, right, in, in terms of what, what is the ideal level of transparency. Um, and I think there are some companies that are further along, but I, I think we're all kind of collectively negotiating where that spot should be. And there was a session uh, on, on Monday about transparency reporting and standards around that, and even just in terms of transparency reporting, as, as it's known as a, a genre, it's, it's mainly about you know, reporting the number of requests you receive. Um, more companies are, are reporting on the number of data requests than they're reporting on takedown or shutdown or blocking requests. And so, you know, how do you get companies to be equally good about all the different types of requests, but, but also being transparent, you know, to kind of reporting some basic information to the public about your processes, for example, like government requests. Your processes for how you're how you're enforcing your terms of service. You know, there's there's a lot of different, and you know, we've got a project where we're kind of working through standards really around transparency, and and kind of debating how high we should hold the standard above what people you know feel that they can currently do, uh, and how hard to push. But but again, the the goal is not radical transparency on everything. The goal is the right amount of transparency so that people understand how power is being exercised, you know, either, either if it's government power via the companies upon the users, or if it's the company exercising its, its power to shape its own service or, or to, to carry out its commercial business. And people need to have sufficient understanding about how power is being exercised over their digital lives and their digital activities and their access to information so that if they feel that power is being abused, they can hold it accountable. Um, and, and that's that's governance. I mean, you know, that's that's you know, for those those who are into, you know, talking to governments about that, it's the same thing. And you know, in this digital age with the new technologies, we're still working out exactly where where the sweet spot is. Um, and not just for companies, for governments, because the flip side is that unless we get governments to be more transparent about what they're demanding, unless we get governments to allow companies to report, um, and, and you know, we need a broader movement to, to, to get governments to reverse some of these awful laws they're passing that are forcing, you know, so there, there's a much broader ecosystem that, that obviously needs to, needs to take place. Good. Um, let me put one more big topic on the table and then kind of open it up for, for questions. We've got a number of kind of lines of, of inquiry open here, but wanted to look at um, companies increasing leverage in their negotiations or discussions, engagement with states. Um, good session earlier this morning on this. Um, obviously, we've heard today a lot about collaboration, working with industry coalitions, trying to bring companies together as a more effective way to gain leverage over states. We've heard about some creative legal mechanisms. Um, potentially using contract law or contract provisions um, to gain leverage over states. What are we starting to see as some of the more effective ways or more creative ways to think about, about doing that? You know, one of the things that was very striking to me when I was in government was how often a single company would come and say, ooh, we have a real problem in country X. Would you, would you help us out? And I'd say, you know, I've heard from three other companies. Have you talked to them? No, we haven't exactly talked to them. Um, it's not possible everywhere. You know, there are places, China would be one that's so big and commercially important that it's hard to get everybody to weigh in. But there are places where I think collective pressure by companies together. You know, the notion that, that governments say you can't talk about what you're doing. I mean, if every company comes in in the same way and says, no, we're not going to tolerate it. There's some places where I think the combination of diplomatic pressure from governments and a united industry position would be enormously helpful. Yeah, and to add to that too, finding allies in civil society and in politics, yeah, exactly. because you know China is an example where you can't do that so much because <laughs> allies in civil society just go to jail when you reach out to them. Uh -huh. But but there are many societies. You know, Turkey would be an example, or the Philippines, or, or many other places where these battles are being fought. That it's where you get that alliance between a part of industry 
and certain actors in civil society who share common goals, and identifying who in the political, you know, who in parliament actually wants to take up this issue. You know, so in the Philippines, there, there's a couple of politicians who've really taken up kind of fighting against bad internet laws as kind of their signature thing. And, and finding the right allies, because, because when you do see progress, it, it tends to be that, that you get this convergence between you know, industry, civil society, and different bits of government from different places kind of converging. You, you almost never get change if it's just one category of actor alone. There's a very good example uh, where uh, the CEO of one of uh, our local companies, uh, of Yosel in Georgia, has uh, initiated this type of discussion and together with an, an, an uh, NGO, in this case Transparency International, which in Georgia works much broader than only anti-corruption. And uh, as you said, with parts of the government, uh, the process is not finalized yet, but it is about changing the law to more uh, democratic oversight and less draconian uh, surveillance laws. So, we hope to push that through, and uh, very much with the help of, of, of the collaboration between between the NGO, uh, the company, and, and, uh, and some politicians. Great. Well, we'd love to certainly hear from more in the room, and if you could just state your name and the organization you're with. Gerald Gray, with Accountability Council. Here in San Francisco, uh, there is a third way in case governments or businesses are not self-regulating, or we can't wait uh, on politicians to be drawn in, or the rule of law takes too long or doesn't function. Uh, we take complaints from communities whose uh, position on environment or human rights um, is that their human rights and environmental um, life is, is being violated by a company overseas, a company from this country, for instance. We've taken 17 cases so far. What we do is go to the funding agencies if they are international, the IMF, the World Bank, and elsewhere. And we prevent, present evidence to those funding agencies because they have rules for behavior when they make a loan. They have rules for behavior for the company that receives that money. The, the communities generally don't know that there are such rules, and the funding agency doesn't know that the rules are being violated. We see that, that the, com the community is informed, that they know how to gather, gather evidence. We present the evidence to the funding agencies, and the funding agencies threaten to not fund further. This means, and, and we've been successful in 17 cases so far in having the companies adhere to the rules. We're prepared to go to court if necessary. We haven't done that because it hasn't been necessary so far. There are other ways to think about how to approach this which can um, overcome some of the frustration of civil society. <laughs> Otherwise, we're relying on government and businesses to behave themselves, and we know what that means. Thank you. Yeah. So, what are some? Yeah, about San Francisco. <laughs> <laughs> At least some quasi-judicial institutions. Yeah. Well, this is you know going you know working with funding agencies. This is a sort of part another side of the strategy of working with investors you know, the financial leverage and socially responsible investment community and, and making sure that they have the data, the metrics, the information they need to include freedom of expression and privacy in their investment decisions along with their, you know, environmental screens and you know, labor screens and, and the, other, the other screens that they, that they use. And, and so absolutely kind of uh, going to the money and, and making sure that the money is well informed about the impact it is having on the people they fund uh, is really key. I think my point is, 
It's innovative. It hasn't been thought of or done. Yeah. And we have to go outside the traditional ways. Yeah. Good. Interesting for you to write that up, actually. I'd love to see something about that. Okay. If you go oh, to the Accountability yeah. Council website, okay. it's written up there right. extensively about the, all the cases okay. they've been involved in, which are fantastic. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it'd be interesting to see how that plays out in the technology sector. I think a lot of the cases so far are mostly in extractives or... Um, Resource extractive industry, yeah. locations yeah. in Asia and South America, yeah. all over the place. Yeah, right. sure. Sure. Uh, my name is John Ty. I work at the U.S. State Department. Um, it's a slightly different tack from some of the things we've been talking about. Some people think that the, the U.S. Supreme Court is taking an inconsistent line with regard to corporate law and certain issues where, on the one hand, corporations are given all of these uh, First Amendment rights to, which is interpreted as donate, you know, you're allowed to donate as much money as you want to political action committees. On the other hand, uh, with some of the, the alien tort statute cases and things, they're, they're saying, well, they don't have to meet responsibilities on the other end. Um, what's your perspective on this sort of this line of Supreme Court cases and uh, sort of what that means for business and human rights? There's a, uh, a recent uh, action brought by the U.S. Chamber of Commerce in uh, one of the Dodd-Frank cases. And essentially, they took the position that their um, free speech rights are being violated by being required to report on the supply chain in the Congo for extractors. Um, you put that case next to Citizens United, and you go, "What?" <laughs> um, the fact is, though, that you know, uh, I don't know how it is in Europe, but it's certainly true here that there's been a huge backlash on the corporate side against using the courts to deal with extraterritorial uh, events. Um, Kivel obviously is a big setback in that regard. So I think it's, it's going to take a lot of work. Um, and there's some other cases sort of percolating up. But I think the disposition of this Supreme Court certainly is not very hospitable to the notion that they're going to be the regulator of this space. It means there's got to be more pressure, uh, alternative pressure, again, some of it reporting, which I think the government probably can do without being challenged, although they are being challenged in, in, in uh, Frank. And I think it means that some of the things we're talking about in terms of industry regulating itself or these multi-stakeholder initiatives, more reporting is going to be, probably play a bigger role, at least in the short term. I don't want to be a downer, but that's sort of what the reports are right now. Yeah, I just want to piggyback on that. Um, Access uh, engaged with MTN, that South African telco, only after, generally after, uh, Turkcell sued MTN in U.S. court using the ATS. Mm. We engaged with them publicly and privately. They agreed to uh, produce a human rights policy, which they did not have at that point. Um, after Keo Bell, a few months later, the case is dismissed and our calls are no longer taken. So I think that shows the, you know, there's a, that shows, you know, this is a private legal action between two large, two large telcos, but it also definitely helped, you know, an NGO to get access. So I'm glad that, that Rebecca's project is going to be ranking that. Yeah, just following on on that point, there's actually, while US, US courts are sort of retreating in terms of international tort liability, other courts are, are getting better with it. So a more expansive interpretation. So Canada, for instance, recently important case with, it's in the extractive sector, but the principle applies across the board that a parent company, a case against a parent company for violations committed by the subsidiary, by security forces hired by the subsidiary, that was allowed to proceed against the parent company and one of the justifications was that you would look to the guiding principles as a standard of care. So you could skip the subsidiary division by applying a direct liability argument to the parent company. That's in preliminary stages, but the principle is actually pretty significant. That now we have a standard of care for certain companies, no matter where they operate. And then, and there's a similar case in, in England, also in the metals context, Montero for metals, but it had to do with risk management systems and whether the parent company put in place the right risk management system. So there is hope and in terms of business incentives, the legal risks are multiplying, but they're multiplying not through legislation.
and multiplying because there's consensus around these standards, which then becomes indirectly binding through you know, private law and international law. <coughs> Were you referring to Hubei now in China, yeah. in Guatemala? Yeah. I have a follow-up on that. Yeah, sure. Um, I'm, first of all, I'm curious, I'm sorry um, if this has already been asked, but about the UN guiding principles becoming ultimately a legal treaty, legally binding document, and or with changes to it, of course. And uh, looking at the case of uh, Jeanette Kawas, who was murdered in Honduras, several years ago, and her case came before the Inter-American Court, but what happened there is applicable internationally, where the court said that environmental defenders are human rights defenders, and those at risk must be protected. And connecting the two mentions that Ruggie made of human rights defenders in the UN Guiding Principles, therefore leads us to a requirement, a duty of governments to protect environmental defenders, particularly those confronting governments and resource extractive industry businesses who are in collusion and complicity uh, against these environmental and land defenders, but also using the guiding <coughs> principles to, which says human rights defenders must be respected by businesses and protected by governments. So I'm wondering if you all have any comments about that. And I have copies of the article about the Collis case um, and the subsequent case. Yeah. But I think the guiding principles played a very useful role in putting this subject on the agenda as a legitimate subject. The guiding principles were a reaction in some ways to the UN norms that were proposed 15 or 20 years ago, which were soundly rejected by every government. The government of Ecuador is trying to reopen that debate. It's not going to succeed. Um, so, and I think the guiding principles don't take us far enough. The notion that companies have a responsibility to respect human rights, lots of companies come to me and they say, that's nice, what does it mean for us? Even due diligence, it's a nice phrase. We've got to look at each industry's specific problems. That, how does an industry make its money? What's its core business? What are the human rights challenges? We've got to establish standards that companies themselves have a role in, a in creating and then do the metrics, the implementation, and evaluation. So I think it's, it's not useful to try to make more. The guiding principles are a point in time, but as Professor Ruggie said, it's the end of the beginning of the discussion. We've got to now move forward with more specificity in terms of standards, implementation, and evaluation. Yeah, and whereas a mutual also, friend of ours likes to say the guiding principles are a floor, not a ceiling. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, and, but, but it's also important to point out, too, that there have been a lot of sets of principles that were under development before the guiding principles came out. So the GNI principles were already quite mature before the guiding principles came out. And there are some projects that are saying, oh, well, you know, now we're going to evaluate the GNI principles based on a ruggie. And it's like, no, the GNI, you know, kind of preceded. And also, the guiding principles are. You know, we're formulated more in the context of extractives and labor rights where it's a problem the company's not following the law rather than the law being the problem to begin with, which is the problem of the ICT sector and for expression of privacy issues. And so, as Mike says, you know, the, the principles kind of as a broad brush are a nice broad brush, but until you kind of work out what they actually mean operationally and then Kind of what the gaps are. There, there are things in there that just, it, you know, for specific industries and specific issues, don't neatly apply one way or the other. Or there's a whole set of things it doesn't really address. So, so Mike's absolutely right in terms of just needing to, to flesh things out. But developing the guiding principles towards a legally binding document. It's not going to happen. Yeah. That's not what they're intended to be. And you're never going to, legally binding means that governments are going to endorse that. Yeah. If they endorse it, they, what governments are going to want to know is what are we actually compelling companies to do? And companies are going to say, each industry is very different. You know, for the telcos, it's very different than extractives. They're very different than somebody manufacturing blue jeans. You just can't have something that says for everybody the same thing. Um, yeah. From a challenge Michael's point a little bit, you mentioned twice that you know companies need to be brought on board to setting up these standards and engagement with companies. And I'm just wondering why are we so convinced that they would be bona fide partners? I mean, I think if you look at the the motive for why companies exist, public or private, regardless of what industry they're in, oil or technology, they have one goal: make money and as much money as possible, return on investment, give value to shareholders. 
And I think if you look at the environmental question, you know, BP, Exxon Valdez, Ecuador and Chevron, these companies will fight tooth and nail to minimize their obligation, to minimize their responsibility, to minimize liability and exposure. That's why they're happy to spend thousands of dollars to outside law firms helping them defend these cases because they'd rather do that than actually address the issue. And so I'm wondering, how can we be convinced then that these standards that we'll be setting up for privacy online is not just going to be the absolute floor? And even though we think it's a ceiling from their perspective, that, you know, we know they want to pay as little as possible. That's just the way it is. How do you reconcile that? Concept? So, well, I, I, what I say first of all is uh, I start from the premise that it's not a sin that companies want to make money, um, but they ought to make money in a way that also respects human rights. And I don't think those things are inconsistent. Does it mean that every company is going to be embracing of this? No. Does it mean it's not going to be a fight over a negotiation over both the language of what the standards are, how they're implemented, et cetera, how they're evaluated, whether some external person comes in to evaluate behavior? No, every one of those things is a fight. But at the end of the day, what's the alternative? Home governments. The United States government, I can tell you, having watched and been in the middle of it, the United States state government is not going to regulate uh, laws oh, that make it brief. harder for U.S. companies to compete globally. It's the same thing with the Swedish government and the U.K. government. Um, the courts, you know, we can say there's a case in Canada or there's a case here and there. It's, it's a tip of the iceberg. There has to be, companies have to be brought into the discussion and pushed to both operate on the theory they're profit-making enterprises, but there have to be rules of the road for the way they operate. And how else did you do it? Yeah, and working with companies to redefine how they define success. Right, I mean, because there's short-term success, which is much more, you know, quarterly results driven. And then there's long-term success, which ends up being defined much more about sustainability, you know. But, sustainability but that relates to communities you're operating in, sustainability related to the environment, sustainability related to the value proposition. And, mm -hmm. and yeah, there, there's tons of companies that kind of give lip service and are, you know, kind of do the minimum. Um, but, you know, un until, unless and until we get to a different world where government, where law is actually going to do what we want it to do, um, you know, you actually have to find a way to work with companies. And, and yeah, you can have a stick. I mean, that's one reason why I'm doing a ranking is to kind of have a bit of a stick. But it's, it's not going to work if I just kind of put it out there and don't engage with companies at all on what the, you know, what what the incentive is to get them to change. You know? And it, it's, it's unfortunately, you know, you end up having to be pragmatic because governments aren't going to pass the laws you really wish them to pass. The single thing that the advocacy community could do that would be the most useful would be to get BlackRock and Magellan and Fidelity to, all I want them to do is do no harm. Stop saying the only thing that matters is the next quarter. I don't know how it is in Europe, but I talked to lots of people on the corporate side who say, we would like to be more sustainable. We'd like to pay attention to environment, to human rights. But we're, you know, I'm out of here if I don't meet my quarterly P&L statement. Well, that's what I'm saying. Is that but, that, but, the market. But, but are you going to address that through regulation, or are you going to address that through kind of working? I'm not sure that it's a binary question. I would, right. go with, I would go with Gerald's point that maybe there's a third way, and that right. I think it's a bit naive to think either we talk to or Google about privacy, I mean, Google really, or you know, we talked to the U.S. government, really? I yeah, think so there's a third way. The What's the third way? I don't get it. I'm not saying I have the answers. I'm just saying that's a question yeah. that needs to be asked. Yeah. But, sure. but isn't and the third way this, this combination of regular... I mean, law is never going to be the answer. That You can draft as many laws as you like, and there's always a way around the law. Absolutely. But it's got to be a combination of... If you're trying to change something, you've got to engage the, the stakeholders who are most engaged. And so here it's government and companies and civil society, workers, etc. So if you just leave one out of the equation, you're never going to change corporate culture by law. You know, that, that can influence over time, but then you find another way to get around it. So how do you change companies if you don't, at some point, also engage them in the discussion? Now, some you may have to discard at some point along the road, but I don't think we can start by the point of saying they're all out of the discussion because of what their motive is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. Slightly. Different question, uh, picking up on the sort of the standards-based approach and, and what governments can do to promote a standards-based approach outside of, of legislation or, or regulation. And, it, and I'm, I'm curious, and I'm watching the work that the International Corporate Accountability Roundtable is doing on uh, national action plans. And, and I say that um, serving 
I serve as uh, Secretary at Role for the Voluntary Principles on Security and Human Rights, and watching what's happening in Europe with the development of national action plans that explicitly reference you know, the government is going to promote the voluntary principles. And some of the governments that are saying that in their national action plans have not actually joined, but we think they're coming. Um, but we're starting to get calls from new companies that, okay, our governments are taking this seriously. They're referencing this set of standards. Maybe we should be participating in this conversation. And as I watch that develop, I think there is a role for the national action plans on implementing the guiding principles to drive some of, at least to a set of voluntary standards. And engaging with those governments, there is a little bit of a stick because they're saying, we are setting forth our responsibility to protect human rights and we're signaling companies to you know, engage in you know, adhere to voluntary standards. But if they don't, <laughs> there is this sense that you know, down the road, if we're still seeing a lot of misbehavior on behalf of companies based on our jurisdiction, we may take further action, whether it's legislation or regulation. So I, I think it's an interesting dynamic. And, and I'm, you know, I know there's a lot of work to develop to work with other governments around the world to develop these national action plans. And I'm just curious in your thoughts about the role of that. Well, I'd be interested. I mean, I've looked at like the UK national action plan. I haven't seen very many others. But I'm interested, I'd be interested to see how many UK-based companies have changed their actual behavior because yeah. of the national action plan. I know, I mean, again, you and I worked on the voluntary principles, trying to get even the European governments to push. Uh, I tried to get Nigeria and <coughs> Libya and Rock and others in, and I didn't, we didn't get a lot of help on that. And so, at the end of the day, you can have a national action plan that says the guiding principles, but when push comes to shove, I want the Dutch and the UK to be saying this actually matters to us, to, to good luck, Jonathan, and say, you better join this, or there's some kind of <coughs> I didn't have a lot of, everybody wasn't rushing to help. Yeah. It's a, a good segue. I want to come back to just to the home state duty, which we haven't really talked a whole lot about, but. Um, if you have a number of companies, say U.S. companies, that are calling the U.S. government and saying, hey, we're having troubles in China, we're having troubles in Iran or other countries, you have diplomatic relations with them, you know the right people to talk to in the government, why don't you guys get on the phone and, and help us out here? Um, where, where does that, where's the responsibility around there, or is that, is that too idealistic? I mean, it, realistically, is that a role that the State Department, for example, wants to play right or can play? Well, it obviously it depends on, you know, some places are easier and some places are harder. But it's much easier, and again, this was sort of our mantra uh, in DRL, it's much easier if you have five or eight industry competitors all saying the same thing. Um, it's very difficult, and it was surprising to me. It was actually, I'd say, bordered on shocking how resistant uh, companies were who were complaining about the same thing to even pick up the phone and talk to each other. We tried to bring them in to say, let's have common strategies. No, they all had their own you know, ambitions to be there. And, and they're so used to being competitive that they weren't, well, this is a place where you should put the competitive juices aside and say we actually have a common agenda. It's in the means to be competitive. We don't, we don't like the other telcos, but in this arena we do, in this context we do each meeting we have a uh, uh, anti-corruption, okay. anti-trust uh, statement, which we need to do, of course. But uh, what does that mean? That we promise each other before each meeting not to discuss any uh, competitive issues, uh, prices, bids, or licenses, or whatever that could be competitive, but because that would break the law. Have you found it helpful um, through the industry dialogue or other uh, collaboration with, with other telcos, say, if you go back to uh, the Swedish government or the Finnish government, are, are they, in fact, more willing to lend support or to help in some situations? Well, the, 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 the nine industry dialogue telcos each have good contacts <coughs> with their respective uh, uh, home governments. I think, uh, at least from my experience, is that I mean, you can't you can't have the government, the home government, promise to in the future help in any case that will emerge, because it depends on all kinds of politics and, uh, and stuff. So, but, but the, my, my firm recommendation to any company would be to have you know point of contact, a very open line, so that if something happens, you can establish uh, uh, contact very uh, swiftly. And, and then, uh, based on that, 
uh, if all of the nine countries can do likewise with their own governments, of course there is more leverage to, to act somehow if something really bad happens. Great. Uh, any other questions from the floor? Yeah. You mentioned the confidentiality clauses as a blocker. Um, in oil mining contracts, the Revenue Watch Institute has done a lot of research showing that uh, though those clauses exist, in their application, they turn out to not actually, they're not needed most of the time. Now, I know that a, a country's claims about national security are going to be a lot more intense and you're going to face a lot more uh, repercussions if you test them or violate them, but is there is there any work being done on that test case of, well, theoretically we could get national security punishment, but but it's still worth pushing the envelope on what you disclose about these kind of practices. I think it's one of the areas that needs a lot of attention. Again, as Rebecca said earlier, everything doesn't or shouldn't be disclosed, and there are some legitimate reasons not to disclose, both on the part of governments and for companies trying to abide by the law. But companies misuse secrecy and national security in such egregious ways and so uniformly. And I think we need to really take a hard look at that and try to find some collective strategies. I mean, one of the things I know in this sector, we're having early discussions with you know, the Googles and Yahoos. Um, it's, it, one of the challenges initially was that you had people in country as the main interlocutors with government making decisions about a whole range of things. And so if you take that decision home, um, you insulate the people who are on the front line, as it were, and you may be able to have some a more kind of uh, arm's length discussion and a more thoughtful discussion about what's, what can be disclosed and what's not. I think the premise ought to be, the presumption ought to be, in those situations where you have a, a repressive government that's saying, this is a violation to even tell anybody we, you, you've colluded with us, I think the presumption ought to be, how do we get around that? And again, try to find an industry position that begins to really push it there. There's got to be a constant pushback against uh, unreasonable secrecy in the name of national security. It's a real problem, and, and you know, again, it kind of also comes back to policy advocacy. There are just so many kind of state secrets laws and, and laws that make it much harder for, for companies to communicate basic information. Uh, sort of a coordinated strategy around improving that. Yeah, or trying, as we've talked about, to come up with some standard uh, yeah. for what that looks like, so yeah. that everyone is playing on the same field. Yeah, and that's part of, you know, necessary proportionate.org, that's one effort to kind of come up with a common set of sort of legal standards for law, at least around surveillance and, and, and law enforcement, but there's, you know, I think other efforts as well to, to try and get, you know, if, if you're a government that's actually committed <coughs> to freedom of expression and privacy, you know, here, here are some of the things you should and should not be doing. Um, and, and the more we can have those kind of principles out, sort of common statements around, and, and again, alliance between industry and civil society on, no. Here's what you, if, if you're a government, you claim to believe in freedom of expression and privacy, this is what you need to do if you want companies to actually be able to protect their end users' rights. Yeah. So standards for, for states? Yeah, standards for states, you know, well. is, is part of it. Yeah. I mean, it, it really goes hand in hand. If you don't have standards for states um, in terms of you need law that actually enables government, that actually enables companies to respect their users uh, and customers' rights. And, and uh, otherwise, it just becomes much more difficult. If I can just add one other piece, which we haven't talked about, which I think is also part of this space. Um, it's it, the issues of secrecy and privacy and national security become are, are much less uh, important or less of a challenge when you talk about the relationship of companies to their customers. And that's also part of this discussion. So when we talk about standards, and I know there's a long-standing discussion about this, I don't think it's probably been as effective as it needs to be, but companies also are, the, the internet industry in particular has basically monetized information about its 
customers who are really a part of its business, their business plans, but there are all kinds of issues relating to uh, privacy in particular that ought to be part of this discussion. That's part of the human rights discussion. And certainly companies, it's within their um, grasp to figure out what do they want to make public and how do they want to deal with those issues. I think we have to include that in the discussion when we're talking about human rights and privacy. Yes, yes indeed. Good. Um, well, we are right at time, uh, so would invite any sort of further discussion with our panelists. Um, but in the meantime, thank you all very much. Uh, very great.